Welcome back to the second part of our conversation with Cheryl Fogo, author, documentarian, screenwriter, and playwright. We continue our conversation on Black history and some of the connections to Heritage Park's historical village. I imagine there was fairly uh, a group of fairly industrious people along the way. What, what part would they have played in, I see uh, the uh, coal mine office, but what part would they have played in natural resource extraction like that, uh, you know, in, in say in the coal mines or in early oil? I think more about the fur trade when I envision a large black presence. And when I think about those other industries, depending on how far back you're talking, often black men acted as translators. There were several black men who had facility with indigenous languages and had family relationships. So of the three black fur traders that have been named in connection with Alberta history and Saskatchewan history, all three were married to indigenous women and had indigenous had descendants who were black and indigenous. Um, so often they were translators. Um, sometimes they were guides. Uh, sometimes they did the physical work or you know were actual fur trappers, etc. and and um, trapping animals and selling skins and whatnot. Um, to learn more about black fur traders, you could you could go to the Canadian Encyclopedia online and look up some articles by a scholar named Bertrand Bickersteff, who talks at quite a good length in in the encyclopedia about Joseph Lewis, who um, is sometimes is also called Joseph Laws or um, Levi. You know, often these people would have different names that they were known by for a variety of reasons, spelling, pronunciation. It was kind of all over the map back then. Joseph Lewis was one. There was the Bonga family, um, a couple of brothers, and then some of their children who had a very early presence in the region. And um, Glasgow Crawford. And sometimes you'll see his name as Crawford Glasgow, again, switched around. Those are three black fur traders who were named and who you can learn a little bit about. But I found an entry in a book called The Black Prairie Archives, an anthology, which was edited by Karina Vernon. And she includes a quote in there by a European who was writing about the fur trade uh, in its early days and said, if you are writing about the fur trade or reading about the fur trade and you are not reading about Black people, that history is very wrong because Black presence was so huge in that industry alone that you have to assume that there's a reason why black people have been left out of those narratives. So again, when visiting the HBC site on Heritage Park, there are these three named and known fur traders or people working adjacent to the fur trade industry. But we have to assume that there were others. And that's, as I say, uh, my aim is for people to see the world like I do. And I simply know that there, there was always Black presence here for as long as there was European settlement here. And people were, um, yes, in some cases, entrepreneurs, you know, trying to, to carve out a living. In some cases, working as laborers, building the railroads, uh, not so much in Canada because that was done mostly by Chinese men who were brought in specifically for that work, but very much a part of the building the railroads in the U.S. before coming up. There's even um, some evidence to indicate that John Ware did that for a time before coming across the border. You know, one of the one of the other sites that we would have seen down on the uh, down in the settlement area near uh, the HBC uh, fort would be I.G. Baker. Um, I imagine that there would have been, if, if there were people at the fort, then there would have been people trading and, and they would have had some sort of a, some sort of a presence in that area too. Absolutely. I recall when I was doing research in the late historian Hugh Dempsey's archives, 
finding several references to black people who were doing business at the IG Baker company. I always think of it as a bit of a romantic site because rumor has it that that is where John Ware first met, saw and met his future wife, Mildred Lewis, was at the IG Baker company. So um, you're right on, Dominic, that it would not have been uncommon. It would have been absolutely a necessary part of life for Black people living in this area to do business at the IG Baker Company. So when you talk about direct history, there's a couple sites on this list of places at Heritage Park um, that come to mind. Uh, one is McKay Cabin, and the other one I think might be Millerville Ranchers Hall, but let's start with McKay Cabin. <laughs> right. So McKay Cabin used to be on the corner of, I think, 3rd Street East and um, Stephen Avenue. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the homes that is associated with John Ware because his in-laws, Charlotte and Daniel Lewis, were believed, and, and there's been enough research done, I'm 98 percent convinced it is correct that they believed in that house at um at the time when John and Mildred got married that John and Mildred got married in the house and that their first child Nettie was her, Janet Amanda Ware um Nettie otherwise known as Nettie was also born in that house so yes that is a, a site of very direct black history and it, it's amazing you know to walk into that cabin and to visualize the Lewises there. They were a very um, outgoing musical family. So when I go in there, I hear music. I hear the piano. I hear Jesse on the piano. I hear Spencer on the violin. I hear singing. Um, I just love going into the McKay cabin and, uh, and thinking about that as a space of Blackness where they would have hosted other Black friends who were living in and around Calgary at that time. You say that they would have hosted, I just want to pick up on something there, you said they would have hosted many of their Black friends. Would they have integrated and, and hosted other kind of white families that would have been in the area too? Or would would it have still been sort of a, I guess segregation wouldn't have been a, might not be the, the exact term for it, but would they have sort of mostly associated with other Black people? No, um, there's evidence to indicate that they had John Ware especially, and, and very comfortably, had many relationships with Indigenous people. And he had many close friendships with white people. So Calgary and Southern Alberta and, and, the, and the rest of the prairies was much more um, multiracial than what any of us ever think about. And we do often think about that binary between black and white or indigenous and white or Chinese and white when the truth is that black people had relationships with indigenous people with Sikh people with Chinese people those relationships were common in my own ancestral heritage and they are relationships that I know about specifically because I heard about them and have photographs um, so I and because I have read these anecdotes about John Ware and his relationships with Indigenous people, I also envision that there's a, an adjacent history in the lives of earlier Black people who are here that resembles that 1910 community where people had, re had wide relationships with different, uh, with people from different backgrounds. Um, cowboys from different racial groups were quite common. And, you know, we know that there was a huge indigenous presence in the world of cowboys as well. Um, there's evidence to suggest there were Chinese cowboys also, and many, many Mexican cowboys. So I, I, when I envision that, um, that world, I do envision it as a black hosted space, but there would for sure have been people from other backgrounds in and out of that house when the Lewises were living there. One of the other sites that I, I assume direct history is Miller Real Ranchers Hall because of John Ware's proximity to that space. But can you tell us if that's true or if I'm 
in the wrong time period. <laughs> that is absolutely a true um, a true assessment on your part. Uh, Millerville Ranchers Hall was on the land of Joe Fisher, who was a, a neighbor and close friend of John Ware down in the Millerville area. And the building was, uh, was funded and erected by a group of friends down in that area. So I not only envision that John Ware would have been in the Ranchers Hall many, many times. Um, I also envision that perhaps he even helped to build it or contributed some money toward it. I've talked with Steve Fisher, who is Joe Fisher's, I think, great grandson. Uh, and he feels that that's probably a really fair assumption to make just because of the relationship between his great grandfather and John Ware and because it was a really a community project. So that is another space that I envision as having a quite a multicultural and multiracial um, presence because of the dances and the, the social events, because the people of the area were more racially diverse than what we envision. My guess is that not just John Ware and other people, you know, perhaps associated directly with John Ware, but also the other black cowboys who were around at that time would have enjoyed a good party now and then in Millerville Ranchers Hall. There's definitely, um, as we've as we've kind of toured through the uh, the park from time to time, uh, there's a uh, a connection to the Wainwright Hotel that uh, that people love to tell the story. It's a great story. So you just shine a shine a light on that for us. Yeah. Well, Tom and Lita Selectman were a black couple who lived in Wainwright, Alberta, and who worked at the hotel. Uh, in a few different capacities over quite a long period of time. I believe they were quite well liked and and um, well known in the community. Uh, she sometimes cooked and sometimes helped out and he also cooked and probably did other things there. I mean, you folks might even be able to illuminate a bit more about their presence to me. I encountered um, the fact of their existence and their presence there in that hotel many, many years ago, but have have not yet had a chance to do a deep dive into where they came from and where they went afterward. I don't think they had children. Do you know? Yeah, I haven't come across any children, but from what I was able to track down, they um, Tom had been a, a, a cook on a, a private railway car in the United States before coming up to Wainwright. And that was as far back as I could trace them so far. Still well, another mystery for us to work on. That's awesome. Well, thank you for adding that that nugget to my knowledge about them. Of course. It's great. Of course. Out of the list that you have, are there a few uh, other sites that you want to make sure that we address here? I I think of, uh, you know, I've, I've touched briefly on the adjacent Black history. So the Vulcan ice cream parlor, John and Mildred's two daughters, Mildred Jr. and uh, and Nettie, lived in Vulcan for many, many years. They lived in Kirkaldi, which is just down the road from Vulcan, and were extremely well-known and popular residents of the Vulcan area. They also lived in that area with two of Mildred's siblings, so Ethel Lewis and Spencer Lewis, who I, uh, Spencer, I referenced earlier as a, being an incredible violin player. And Ethel Lewis, who was an amazing woman, Mildred's younger sister, she was a carpenter and she could ride a horse just so, so well. She just looked so comfortable on horseback. There's a photo of her, even though women of those eras had to dress in the way they did, they didn't get comfy jeans like John Ware had uh, for riding. And she was also a poet. She was just a really incredible woman. She lived in the area as well. So all of them and their friends and visitors who were Black or otherwise would have frequented that Vulcan ice cream parlor. So when you sort of envision um, representations of people 
who who would have been there absolutely it would be more than fair to represent black people in that space same with uh, the baron's snooker hall as i mentioned um true saloon is another place because it was in high river or near high river in 1886 and would have been really close to um the crossing it was known as which was another kind of saloon slash stopping house there are many records of john ware being in that area and attending new year's eve parties and um, big big gatherings that cowboys had because they you know wanted to blow off steam at the end of roundup and that kind of thing so that's another space that i assume or think of as a black adjacent you know black history adjacent i don't have any specific references but i feel certain there would have been a black presence there then there are other spaces um that i love to visit like the um the blacksmith shop Fletch, um, is that it? Yeah, Fletch. Yeah, because there were Black people who did blacksmithing. The first blacksmith in the Pincher Creek area was a Black man named Charles Dyson. Uh, he was married to a woman named Elizabeth Jess Jefferson Dyson. And so when I walk into Fletch, I picture Charlie and Elizabeth in that space. I was thinking um, if there's kind of a couple of things that you would want us to take away from thinking about Black history and Heritage Park in Southern Alberta that you could share with us. Well, you've been you've been very generous in allowing me to talk about um, how how I would like people to see the world, how I would like people to start just making assumptions that there were black people rather than what I think me, most people assume is that there were not black people. Right. Unfortunately, I think that's how most people who walk through a space like heritage park. Um, I think they make those presumptions. When I first started talking with heritage park about trying to better represent the black history there, I extracted a, a promise or a commitment that the time that I invest with the park would be honored because it is my hope that people will see, uh, will, no, will no longer be able to assume that there was no Black presence because they don't see it. People can't know about that presence if we don't share it with them, right? Right. If we don't tell people, if we don't show not just mm -hmm. tell, but show people that there were Black people here with photographs, with representation in, in the different ways that the park does it, with plaques. People won't be able to make that assumption on their own. It is my hope that in five years, the typical visitor to Heritage Park will have a completely transformed vision of life in this part of the world historically and that they will make assumptions that there were black people in these spaces because that's the reality of it um i want people to understand that black people had unique struggles and still have in this part of the world but i also want people to envision all the joy and the love that we have had in our communities over the years that have sustained us. That's why it's such a pleasure for me to just be alone whenever I can in the McKay cabin to immerse myself in what I know would have been a very joyful space of blackness. When we talk about, of course, John Ware, you know, seems to have these tentacles that, that, you know, go out everywhere and, and being such a well-known, um, black person in uh in western canada or on the prairies especially when he was designated a person of national significance not long ago what do you think that that does and as somebody who has probably an expert would be considered an expert on john ware and his life what do you think that that does for people's understanding of of black history and and not only that but of bipoc history in in western canada I think it's both 
a slightly opened door for some because some people will see that and think, oh, there was that one Black person. But I think for many, it will be an open mind and uh, an opening into a window onto Black presence. There are people who will do a deeper search because they go out to the Bayou Ranch and, Ranch and they see that plaque there that talks about John Ware. And it does talk about other Black history. And they'll, they'll do a deep dive. Maybe they'll go see my film and they'll look at the connections I made in my film between Black people who were here before John Ware and the connection between John Ware's life and my own life because there were so many people in my ancestral community who were friends with John Ware's children. So I think for many, it will open not just a door. It will not be just a, a door that's a little bit open. It will be a window that allows them to see a bigger world than they thought was there a more interesting world and a more truthful picture of what our history has looked like going back for centuries now. If there are places, Cheryl, that, that people, is there some sort of a, a place or a repository of, of kind of this, these, this archival material that people can go and look at and, and really learn more about that, the history, the black history in uh, on the prairies in Western Canada? There is no one place to go and learn about all of the history. Um, I've mentioned a couple of resources. There's the um, the Black Prairie Archives, an anthology edited by Karina Vernon, which is a great book. There, um, you know, I have to include my own work. I've been I've been working on disseminating these stories for more than thirty years. So, I have two films that are available online one is John Ware Reclaimed on the National Film Board website and another is called Kicking Up a Fuss the Charles Daniels story about a black railroad worker who sued the Grand Theater and Sir James Lougheed because they wouldn't let him take his seat in the theater that he had paid for uh, there is um, I believe there's an online exhibit that is still available called we were here yep. that the royal alberta museum did a couple of years ago that's a great resource about the 1910 migration and their descendants um i mean it's, it's there there are more and more resources out there now there is a film called tracks t-r-a-x that if people ever get a chance to see, they'll learn kind of a different aspect of kind of the entertainment history and people who were connected to the dance and music communities of, of this part of the world. Um, yeah, just more and more resources out there. Uh, another great exhibit called um, Dancing Black in Canada that has a really strong piece based in Western Canada. They're just, we are connected to every aspect of history. So it's almost like you could you could look at any specific type of history and do a, a deep dive into what was the Black presence in those different histories. Oh, that's so great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Yeah, I guess finally, I would just say maybe Heritage Park at some point <laughs> in the future can become um a real a real place of dissemination of this history as well you know as you say people go to parks like heritage park and museums looking for history when people get used to seeing black history there uh, they will it will just really open up their minds and make for just such a better world in my opinion well we're really happy that you shared with us today your repository that's up in that brain of yours so uh, thanks a lot, Cheryl, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, it was a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Cheryl.